Good evening, viewers, and welcome to Calypso Showcase. Our special guest tonight, when he appears on stage, they say his clothes is funny, his song is funny, in fact, his sobriquet is funny. Donrick Willi Williamson, welcome to Calypso Showcase. Well, first of all, what part of Trinidad did you grow up? Where, where were you, you know, where did you hang out in your early youth? Um, Movant, Cipriani Street Movant. I was actually born in Port of Spain, but I left there as a baby. I grew up in Mova. And um, did that environment have anything to do with the type of Calypso that you are today? Well, a bit, yes. Uh, although, I mean, what I do comes natural, but, you know, I grew up in Mova as a place <laughs> with a lot of humor, at least the, the area I live in, you know. Uh, you know, a lot of humor, a lot of young men, you know, grew in that area, and we used to have fun. Well, the name funny, it's obvious why that's so okay, but when did you actually decide to use that as a title for your Calypso career? Uh, when, I, when I started, when I decided I'm going to start a sing, um, actually, people, some people started calling me funny because I, uh, my bigger brother, apparently they used to call him funny when they see me, they used to call him, they used to call me funny. And, you know, that name stick on me. And when I decided to sing Calypso, you know, I, I couldn't find another name, <laughs> so I used funny. You know, all my friends are calling me that. You know something we have talked about in this program before? A lot of Calypsoonians shy away from humorous type Calypsos. Why do you think that is so? Well, it's hard to make. Um, humorous guys so is not, it's not easy. Um, and then it, it, is, it must come natural, you know. Humor is something that comes natural, you know. If, if, if anybody can do humor, mm -hmm. it's something that comes out of you, you know, your, your lifestyle, you know, the way you think. That's how humor. So it's more than just lyrics then? Yeah, it's more than that. It's got to come from, you know, the person. In terms of the recognition that uh, humor as a, as a category of Calypso, do you have any recommendations as far as that is concerned? What can be done? Humor as a category? Hmm, well, I, I don't know. Um, maybe, as maybe and that is something um, we're trying, um, if you're speaking about like in the competitions and mm -hmm. so, yeah, well, humor, like any other things, it could make a category, yes. Yeah, I, because I it, it seems never to really hold its own against uh, the political and social commentary on some of the heavier topics. And maybe there's a need for some sort of encouragement for those people who hold on to that uh, humorous category. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that, well, it's worth a try. I mean, um, I've been hearing a lot of talk about it, you know, you know, but in, in the competition categories, you know. And um, I think it's something somebody should start, you know, trying to work on and try it and see how it works. All right. Well, we're going to take a look at the Calypso life of Donrick Williamson tonight. We're going to take a commercial break. And when we come back, we'll go to his home. You know, it's a strange thing that many Calypsonians start their career at the CDC tent, and you are no exception. Uh, way back in 1966. Tell us how you, you came to audition and become part of that Calypso tent. Yeah, well, um, a friend had introduced me to King Solomon sometime because of a schoolmate of mine um, who sing. He used to do a lot of pops and things. And, um, I met King Solomon after that one day in Port of Spain and he told me about the Calypso Association. He introduced me there and I joined and um, around Carnival time when they had the audition, I went on audition, and I got selected to sing in the tent. Well, it's, it's fascinating that your first Calypso is a tune which is one of your trademark songs, and which was not, by any stretch of imagination, a funny Calypso, Sweet Sweet Trinidad. Tell us about that composition. Yeah, well, um, what happened is too that um, that song, I changed some of the lyrics um, when I recorded it. Um, I sang that in 66 and recorded it. It wasn't recorded until uh, 75. Well, um, you know, I just decided to make a song about Trinidad. As a matter of fact, that, was one, that song was made together with a, a couple dozen songs that I, I had before, a long time. Foreigners always asking me why in Trinidad people so happy what to do. Man, I had to tell them the truth. I say a man could sleep until 10 o'clock. Get up and still he ain't late for walk away or reform. He get in transport in front of the door. 
And this poke a poke they go in hold they are not pay they still draw a big fat pay if they like they could call a big strike so I tell them sweet sweet Trinidad boss I love this country but I don't want to live at all ever since a small look of all in sweet sweet Trinidad When I dead, please bury me in the center of the city. Yes. I was doing that in a song they call Vicey, which is, was a suggestive song. Both of them are on record. Now tell me, I know that we started in 66, but where did Calypso really begin for you? On the block, um, I used to, um, I had a guitar, I, I took two lessons and um, I learned to play a little bit and I used to sing a lot on the block by me um, and a guy who used to live in the area introduced me to a group they call Entertainers Association, which I joined and they used to do little shows about the country. So I was singing um, a little before I, I came on um, came on the Calypso scene in the tents. Um, I even I entered a competition in 1965 when my friends told me they saw this thing advertised in the papers. I went and I was one of the finalists. I knew I won the competition, although I didn't come in the first three. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you know, um, I was told so after, and the whole thing was changed. There was a lot of confusion in it. I was doing a song they called Missing Ball and um, Just Imagine. Yes, imagine, friend, imagine What was the first Calypso you ever composed in your life? Um, a song called A Dozen Men on the Ground, which was a gunslinger tune. <laughs> yeah. You can remember any part of it? Yeah, um, it was something like this. Um, I just leave me home, peacefully and going to work. I don't look for noise, with nobody I do make jokes. But they just watch you just like that, and start to beat you up. And if you're in drop cold dead, friends they wouldn't stop. But I ain't want no guns. I ain't want no knife. I don't want no cutlass, but when I want the life, I walk in with hand grenades, dynamite, or even bomb. I show when I pull the pin, a dozen men on the ground. <laughs> Amazing. Thinking I doesn't want that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, who are some of the Calypsonians that you looked up to in the early stages of your career? Oh, um, well, of course, for us, like Melody, of course, Kitchener Sparrow, Spoiler was one. Um, Christo, a lot, a lot of these guys, I, I used to listen to, um, of course I didn't know a lot of these guys, like, like Spoiler is one guy, I, I never knew him, I've never even seen him sing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you hear fellas like Lion and Viper and all these, you know, these fellas singing and I, I always had an interest, you know, in the Calypso. See this, the land of Calypso, I always love Calypso. But people always compare you to the mighty Spoiler. Did you set out? to sing humorous calypsos from the start of your career? No, not really, no. All, although I was um, always, I used to humor the guys on the, on the block, most of my early songs were humor. And um, as you, yes, you saw, the, the first song wasn't a humor song. Correct. Um, I like humor, I mean humor is my thing. Um, I grew up in a neighborhood, you know, with a lot of humor. Well, when we continue with your career and we look at 1969, as early as that, a tune like Farmer Brown, 
which has again become one of your trademarks, one of your classics. Tell us what prompted you to come up with a Calypso like Farmer Brown. Okay, um, well I know this through the years before, always hear um, guys singing songs and when they reach to that point, you know, they always say, are you or are you? They wouldn't say they would. And I always tell myself one of these days I'll be able to make a guy so that I could bring that out. I was going through a student companion once as I saw um, um, where the, the male is called the Jack and the, the female is Jenny and I said, well, you know, that was the message. Mm -hmm. And I decided to make it, but um, Farmer Brown, I started to make Farmer Brown about a whole family. You know, the typical family, son, daughter, mother and father. And it was taking too much time to introduce the whole family. And I just say, you know, away with the rest of them, just the farmer alone, and I decided to deal with just farmer wrong, yeah. Well, it turned out to be one of the biggest hits of 1969, and subsequently, I think, any time you go on a stage, people want to hear that Calypso. Yes, yes, farmer wrong was one. It was the first recording I did, and it was very popular. Farmer Brown tied the jackass on a rotten tree. Then he jumped on the bike and he gone down the road in the rum shop to spree. The jackass pants up and get away and it gone cross by neighbor John. The neighbor gone to the farmer in the shop and start to get on. He tell him, the jackass of yours, Farmer Brown, you better come and see. Because it pulled down the tree, was with the chain on it inside my property. You are sure going to lose it, so you better do something fast. Because if it should damage my property, so help me, I'll kill your ass, I tell you. The success that you gained in 1969 sort of set you up for 1970. People were looking at Funny and saying, what is this guy going to come with in 1970? And not many people will remember mm -hmm. how successful 1970 was for you. In fact, my first real rec anytime I think of you, I remember you all in white with this oversized uh -huh. toothbrush <laughs> in the Grand Savannah singing, yeah. um, check it up or check up or something yeah, like that. Check up. Yeah. Right, uh, tell us a little bit about that composition in the year 1970. Yeah, well, um, 1970 was one of, I think, um, if not the best, one of the best years I had because I was doing two songs which used to get four and five encores, both songs, um, check up and suck it to me. And um, I remember that year getting hoarse. And I couldn't sing for about four nights and I used to go on the stage and dance. And they used to anchor the dance because people just wanted to see me there. Well, check up was um, is about the teeth. Well, I sing it. I sing it a lot now. Eh? Um, I resurrect it and bring it back now. Suck it to me. I haven't done for a long time. And I got into the finals. You eat and you drink and all life is sweet. But when last did you check up on your teeth? You eat up, you drink up, you say life sweet. But why don't you make a check on your teeth? Your teeth is a thing must clean every day. If you don't, your teeth will shut to decay. Just look at my teeth, so clean and white too. So why don't you try to do as I do? I get up in the morning, I rush. After I had my lunch, I rush. If I eat between I brush. I've come in that time. I brush. And if I happen to just drink some whiskey or gin, before I go to sleep, I go and brush again. Yeah. You know that song. Have a little history. Um, a guy who used to work in um, the Antigua airport. He said he came down one night and um, he heard me singing and. Um, once he had a night off again and he took a flight and come down just to hear that song and I was in Antigua and he carried me home to sing it for his children. He says educational, check up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I always remember you being one of the high points of mm. the cast in the 70s. And yeah. Let's talk about some of the material that you offered us in the 70s. Okay, um, we had well in 70s, check up and uh, suck it to me. I had songs like Bam. Bam C. Yeah, yeah, Bam <laughs> was done in the 70s, yes. That was 75, right? Around there, right? 
Yeah. And uh, there was another tune I remember you had on Soul album, Chick. Soul Chick. Was, yeah, Soul Chick was, was um, a seven inch, one of seven inch. Well, Soul Chick so was my biggest hit, that was 73. What do you think yeah. accounted for that selling so much? Well, I know people just like it, you know. Um, had a nice catch for you. Yeah, so that, and I, what happened was I, I have noticed that um, everybody was using the slang. Mm -hmm. So everybody was using the slang. The, the smallest child to the to the oldest person. Yes, me neighbor way, Molly. Ask me to build a cook, cause she, she couldn't stay, she was busy. So she leaves she daughter home with me. But she daughter, Jessie me, the girl up under me the whole day. And anything I do, you see, she only asking me. How we all could walk so? How we all could not so? How you could groove? No. How you could move? No. How you could wail? No. How you could nail? No. How you could do? No. I, I was in Madison Square Garden that year to sing. I went up there and a guy called me and asked me how much money I made from it. And um, while I was, you know, thinking of what to tell him, he said, I understand that song sells over 500,000. And, you know, I, I didn't take him serious. I thought he was exaggerating. I mean, it's not until some years after I realized that the song really did something, some years after, because a lot of people told me a lot of things about the song. One journalist told me it sell like hops bread in Europe. I know for a fact it crossed the 100,000 soul check. I know that. I even sang it in the prisons. <laughs> and surprisingly, all the prisoners, when I started singing, they just catch on to the chorus and started singing it. Prison in New York. Yeah. yeah. What about the style of dress that you use on the stage? How much thought do you put into that? Well, um, lately now, well, my wife has a lot to do with the way I dress. She, she <laughs> usually buy the materials and, well, design a lot, a lot of it too. Mm, I remember one day once you, you performed a long tie, oh, well, touching all the way that, to the That is my own thing. I got that in a, in a, in a, in a shop in, in New York, um, a tie. And I had a long, a big um, glasses, um, shades too, a handkerchief. Yeah, well, that is my only. Well, that um, that has nothing to do with what I sing. And when I when I do these things, it's just I'm just clonging. It has I mean, nothing to do with what what I'm singing. Part of your presentation. And just being funny. Yeah. Let's talk about um, some of the tunes that have stood out over the years as trademark tunes. A tune like say Skuku Chik. Uh -huh. And I mean, you know, just the, the, the title of that song, what would give you the, the idea? What, what inspiration did you get to come up with a name like Skuku Chick? Uh, well, <laughs> well, I had to find a name for, for, I had to find a name for the song. And um, I mean, imagine you're in an old wooden motel and you're here, you know, I mean, it's creaking when people walk, it's creaking and you, and you turn on the bed, it's making noise. I slept on bed like that already, mm -hmm. when it's spring sticking here and all of that. And, um, if you're here in a bed here and you're making a noise and one day and one day, all around you're making noise, I mean, <laughs> I had to find a, a, a name for the noise, you know, I had to find somewhere all the noise going, so it was Kuku Chik. I had to spend a night in a old wooden motel. Nothing there was right by the smell alone you could tell. On my right side, it have a couple. On my left side, another couple. The mattress lumpy, the floorboards creaking. You talk about the old bed spring. They go, scrook a cheek, scrook a cheek. On my right side, scrook a cheek, scrook a cheek. On the left side, scrook a cheek, scrook a cheek. All around me, scrook a cheek, scrook a cheek. And that lumpy mattress nearly drive me mad. And it's scrook a cheek, scrook a cheek, scrook a cheek, scrook a cheek. Whole night I had it hard. one of what we call the uncrowned kings and I think truly if there is an uncrowned king you are one in that you've always pleased the people but you've never really received that regal statue. In performing in the Enjak uncrowned kings you chose a certain number of tunes and we're going to mm. talk a little bit about how you feel because that has, we have a special place for that in terms of the independence of the 25th. 
but one of the other tunes that you sang, beside Farmer Brown, which was one of the tunes, you sang a tune called um, A Soul Man. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about A Soul Man and the, the double entendre that you tried to get out of that. Yeah, um, I did that in 81. Um, well, social commentary, well, uh, you know, I, I was watching uh, the situation in the country, you know, and uh, I think around that time is when things started to, you know, change in the country a lot and, um, you know, reading and the papers and, you know, seeing you know, stories and the papers and, you know, watching what's going on around. The idea came to me about the, you know, the soul men, you know, these people only soul in. And that's how the idea came. Them politicians in this country only good for cocktail party instead of they see how the country they dig in soul with some young day. Always with a glass, drinking must be mouthful like they always come to wine and dancing. And believe me, they get soul more than anybody who they put in charge of the culture. Ah, soul man. Who in charge of agriculture? Ah, soul man. Who's supposed to see for them highways? 